Howard. Okay, perfect. We are live. Head off to the side here. Okay, so welcome to 1583. We have split sections here. So we have those of you who are in the classroom with me. Uh, and then we have those of you who are online. And so uh, the class will be taught in a very similar way. It will just be slightly, oh, can you leave that just slightly cracked? There's one other student who's in this section. If you close it, they'll be locked out. So this is exciting. This is the first in-person class I've taught since 2019. So this will be a lot of fun. Now, I still have the, um, the online capacity here as well, but all of the lectures that we're doing today will be posted on, a, um, on Moodle. I'll show you what the Moodle looks like. The Moodle should be live now, uh, but I kind of want to start by, I guess, introducing myself and, uh, and just walking through the syllabus. And then we'll see how much time we have to actually do some lecture. But I want to make sure everyone's on the same page as to what 1583 and 1581, what uh, kind of software design and development one is all about. Uh, so let's start with introductions. I'm Ted Holmberg. My primary role with the department is dedicated as a industry liaison, which means that I go ahead and I get to communicate with our industry partners to ensure that what we're teaching in the classroom from freshman to senior level is congruent with the expectations of what you'd expect be expected to do in industry, right? And in addition to that, I try to line up internships with you. So it's critical for me to have my pulse on the skills, the technologies that you should be learning. And so uh, we, 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 we do a lot to try to ensure that that's the case over the course of the semester. Now, as a secondary role that I have, I'm also an instructor. So I teach this class, the intro to Java class. I typically teach, uh, I've also taught the second class, the Java 2 class, the software and design uh, of 2. And then finally, I teach the web frameworks class. So those are typically the three classes that you could potentially hit me with. Here you got me in 1583, which means you could potentially get me for at least two more, right? Because this is the very first in a sequence, the intro sequence, in fact. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I have an office on campus, but uh, I, I've migrated all of my office hours since, uh, since 2020 to be on Discord. And one reason why that's the case is before 2020, we had a very strong, vibrant student community on campus where we actively did things on a daily basis. And it's exciting to see a classroom filled with students for the first time because one of my initiatives for this semester is to bring back that face-to-face -face community that we once had and start doing things like end of semester parties or Halloween parties or maybe game nights on the third floor. Uh, or bring in speakers that you can come and talk to who are our alumni or in the industry. But for a long time, we had to be relegated into the realm of online, to the cyber realm. And so uh, because of that, we, we had to incubate and create an online community. And so that we host that through Discord. So by all means, everyone join the Discord server. That's where I actually host all my, uh, my office hours. And I actually really like hosting my office hours there. And the reason why is uh, they have the ability to kind of crowdsource questions, right? So if say, for instance, you ask a question, you get to read it or you get to answer it. So it's a, it's a, it makes it more impactful when everyone can kind of be a part of the conversation. And I found that having like an online community has really enabled that more so than just explicitly a face-to-face -face community. Um, also, we, you can also direct message me on Discord as well. So I do have an office. You can find me at my office, but I won't have any published office hours because I'll help you as you need help through Discord. Just hit me up with a message and I'll respond to you as, as uh, quickly as I can. Uh, let's see, what else do I have on here? Yep, this uh, phone number is not connected anymore. Disconnected it. 
so again, I think the takeaway is use Discord. I do have an email, but I guarantee you I respond faster with Discord. <laughs> Let's see here. Zoom, I do have the Zoom. Presumably, you're either in the class or you're already watching me, so I don't have to share the Zoom, but, uh, but just know that it's not the syllabus there. Let's see, and then uh, that Moodle link is probably not that ID for this semester. Okay, let's see. So the online delivery, we get to see my aspirations from when I first this uh, syllabus. So you might see, oh, did I do there? Okay, so you might see here that in the online delivery, I have recorded videos, theory-based lectures. Well, what that just turned out to be is all my old lecture video made it there. You're not necessary. You do not have to watch that. I made it. For a number of years, can usually identify if it's, it's pretty true, like the uh, classes. Online people can't see if I draw on the board. So I'll, I'm always tempted to show on the board. I'll have to uh, find a solution for that. Okay, so uh, the usually makeup of a class is pretty accurate to what you'd expect. It follows the Gaussian curve, right? So usually uh, you have an outlier of students. Typically it's about three or four in a class. Let's see how many we have like 25 people online and then we have 15 people. So it might be five or six that really are energized by the subject domain. They invest all their time into it. They, they, they really put the nose to the grindstone on there. And so I like to try to challenge those students, but at the same time, I can't teach a class at a breakneck speed, right? It's unfair to those who don't have the time, the gumption or the will to throw themselves all into it. So I try to cater to the mean, but also those outliers that want to excel, I want to also foster that, right? I don't want to hold anyone back in the class. Now, in this class, there's no expectation that you've ever programmed before. In fact, let me do a quick query here. How many of you have coded before? Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So about seven students. In, what about online? Let's see what we have here. I've not... So this is pretty good. I'd say, so it looks like about a third of the class has some software level experience and then probably about two thirds of the class does not. And that's completely fine. Like the entire point of software design one is to ensure that everyone is on equal footing for software design two. And so what's gonna happen is we're gonna spend an entire semester ensuring that everyone has a very strong foundation in not only uh, coding practices, but coding practices that adhere to an object-oriented approach. And so because of that, we're gonna use the Java programming language, which is a wonderful programming language if you want to adhere to a object-oriented approach. Uh, and it looks like some of you have actually had some experience with some object-oriented languages like Java or C++. I see some Ruby in there. I'm sure some of you probably have some Python programming experience or JavaScript programming experience, which is great. In fact, if you use modern-day JavaScript, it can look very similar to Java. So let's see here. But 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 if you haven't programmed before, don't be... You shouldn't be intimidated, right? Like the, we're gonna start at a ground zero. But for those of you who have, try to challenge yourself. Watch videos ahead of time. I made all the homeworks already available as well on Moodle. You should be able to see everything. So you could read ahead to see what's the flow of the class will look like. Anyways, so you'll see that I have my, uh, my lecture theories. Those are just old lectures. If you wanna get ahead of the class, you can watch them. Uh, but it's not necessary. What I really wanted to do was just do all my theory-based uh, explanations and, and videos, but it's really time-consuming. I haven't had a chance to put this together yet. Now, for our lecture hour, this is a hybrid class. Obviously, you found this class, Math 209, uh, from 11 to 12.15, and then also inside of my Zoom session. So the Zoom recordings will be made available typically 
no later than the next day. And what I'll likely do, what I've had a lot of luck recently, is publishing the videos on a YouTube playlist. So I'll probably make a playlist for this class. I'll share it inside of the Moodle, and then you can just go ahead and follow. And so actually, you could look at the other lectures that I've taught prior as well. So I have the Java 2 lectures on YouTube and I have my Web Frameworks uh, class on there as well. Okay, let's see here. We have, oh, and then here, this is just the Discord where I said, this is where our student hours and discussions are. So what are the prereqs for the course? Well, there's prereqs and there's a concurrent recs a requirement. So the prereq is that everyone has at least had applied algebra. And really the rationale behind that is Despite what a lot of media might present to you, computer science doesn't necessarily have or require a lot of strong mathematical knowledges. I will say, though, the more mathematical knowledges you have, the more it'll enable you to be more performant as a developer. But just having basic algebra is all the bare requirements is. But you do need algebra at the very least, because think about what algebra is what what was what was the defining point of algebra like what separated algebra from the course that came before algebra what's that called pre-algebra this is great i'm not talking to a screen anymore so i can start actually getting answers <laughs> the advantage of being in person okay so what did you learn what what was the distinction with algebra when you went to algebra what was so special about it what was the new novel thing that they taught here? Formulas? Yeah, so formulas, right? So And so formulas, you effectively have something in the vein of a variable, right? A, a non-numerical value. Like once you put, once you ascribe a number inside of a mathematical equation, it's concrete, it's definite, it does not change. But a function allows us to define some behavior where you can replace the variable with a value and that value then gets processed and produces a result. Well, at the end of the day, that's everything we do with software, right? So all of our software is driven by the concepts that were initially taught in algebra. And so you can learn more complex mathematics. You can learn linear algebra, you can learn differential equations, you can learn uh, topology, you can learn graph theory, you can learn combinatorics, you can learn statistics, and all of these maths will make you a more capable developer, but the bare minimal of what you need is just that concept that you can create an equation where one of the values, at least one of the values, is non-constant. It can be replaced out with a value of your choosing, because that's the driving principle on how we build mathematical models. And so this concept of mathematical models I'll get to later on in the lecture, or yeah, hopefully later on in this lecture, uh, it, it's, that's what drives any repeatability, any kind of ability to articulate in a non-error-like way uh, in any domain. It's not, it's not just computer science where we go ahead and develop models and algorithms around these models. Uh, if you go into physics or biology or chemistry or business or accounting, right? I, in fact, I would challenge you to name any profession it's going to have, they'll have some kind of rigid model that they construct on top of mathematics. And again, we'll talk more about that when we get there. But the nice thing about computer science is that's what we specialize in. So really computer science is like the, it's the science of processes and processing. And so typically what you'll find if you go and become a professional software developer is you'll be tasked with building software that solves problems in almost any other domain. And so you learn how to, how to solve those problems that are chemistry problems or physics problems or business problems. And what you're gonna realize is they all use a similar set of techniques on how to build a model and then a set of uh, algorithms, a set of processes on top of that model that derives whatever the result is, whatever the solution is. 
And then that's one reason why software is so popular now, because it solves every other professions and domains problem. The ability to automate tasks. Okay, so uh, that was a long explanation for prereq of math. Okay, so am I charging? Yeah, okay. So then in addition to that, everyone should be cross-enrolled in 1581, right? Perfect. And the reason why is that you, you don't want to think of this so much as a three-hour and one-hour course. You want to think about this as like a four-hour course. This is the theory course. And then 1581 will be the practical, hands-on, let's see if we can apply the concepts we talk about in lecture course. And so has anyone been to the lab yet? Have they had labs already? Yeah. So I'm sure they already explained the grading for the labs, right? So the way that's going to work is your lab grade is 30% of this grade that, I, that you have in the lecture. And whatever I give you in your lecture, you get in your lab. So, right, so they're, they're, they're interwoven that tightly. They're, they, you get the same grade for both classes. So you do your lab work. It's worth a third of your grade for both your lab and your lecture, but also do your coursework because the lecture grades were, well, you know, 70% of your grade for the lecture and the lab. Okay, so if for any reason you feel like you're getting lost, uh, we do have a Java help desk. We do have a help desk. It's uh, available both online at this link, helpdesk.cs.uno.edu. We have not, I have a schedule that's an old schedule right now that's posted into Moodle, but I didn't remove it so that I can recall where it goes when I get the new schedule. So we're right now actively hiring the new set of tutors, but typically we don't need tutors on the first week. But like moving to the second and third week, if you feel like you're kind of getting lost and you can identify that, seek help, right? Like we offer the department definitely wants everyone in here to succeed. And unfortunately, that's not the case. It's never been the case for as long as I've been teaching. Typically, the numbers that uh, happen in this classroom is about a third of the student here and I guess online too, uh, will not make it past this class. And that's been pretty consistent numerically. So what that tells me is if you look to your left, and if you look to your right, then if you look at yourself, one of you will not be in the next class. But this is the other thing I'm going to say. If you want to make it to the next class, the only one who would be hindering you is yourself. Now, I, I always I always get the same thing too. Everyone super motivated at the beginning of the semester, but you got to carry that motivation into the middle of the semester and the end of the semester if you truly want to get through the program. I won't lie. The program is a lot of work. I'm not going to say it's hard. It's not, but it is difficult. And so, unfortunately, the only way you're going to become adept at developing at programming is by doing it and by studying it and just be vigilant in absorbing it. And it is a lot of work. And so I'm letting you know ahead of time, it's going to be a lot of work and you got to commit to it. And I think for those of uh, the students who, who don't commit, who, who just come to class, but they don't do the homework, they don't necessarily try to practice outside of the lab, the, uh, they, they don't do extra lab problems or they, they don't do many of the lab problems or even understand how the lab problems work. Like the idea behind the way that all the course material has been created is to challenge you and have you grow. Uh, for those of you who haven't developed, and maybe for those of you who have, for those of you who have coded, maybe you can back me up and try to convey this to the other part of the class that has it. Building code is, or, 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 or authoring code is a different way of thinking about things. And it's one that's been identified as algorithmic thinking. So uh, has anyone gone through like a English class where they go into a critical thinking class? Do they still teach that? Is that still a thing, critical thinking? No, they don't teach, yeah, so, <laughs> been out of, uh, been out of the, 
not in that side of the classroom that often. So, so they don't teach like how to like uh, break down a, uh, let's say a research paper or like a story to a set of themes and a set of characters and a set of premises that lead to a conclusion. They, they just don't call that critical thinking anymore. What's it called? They do, okay, perfect. Well, I'm gonna call that critical thinking. So I remember when I was going through um, school very many years ago, uh, that was one of the big things that they really focused on, the concept of critical thinking. And so right now, one of the big movements is to then identify a different way of thinking about things, an algorithmic way. And so that's what we're gonna step through. And so one of the most challenging parts about learning how to develop software is adapting the way that you think about things in a way that's in line with building out code. And so that's what we're really gonna to try to gain a mastery of over the course of this semester. Um, okay, well, that covers what I wanted to talk about with peer help and tutoring. I'd also suggest that if you have any questions in addition to the help desk, ask on Discord, right? We have a ton of upperclassmen who are willing to help and the Discord is available. Let's see here, actually, let me, let me quickly load up Discord so you can see. Has everyone used Discord before? Yeah, that's why we use Discord. Also, it's got more, it supports markdown, which means I can go ahead, syntax highlighting and the questions. It's a, a really cool platform. It's the only social media I engage in now. Mm. Maybe that in Goodreads. Okay, well, while we wait for that to um, update, let's move. Okay, so in terms of the resources that we have available, you have the textbook. Now, I believe that the university charges you a fee called the Folic fee. Yeah, so that gives you your textbook for free. I, I say free, that's, that's a misnomer, right? You are paying for that textbook because those fees are expensive, but you should have access to the textbook through there. And I think I have a link in Moodle on how you can access there. Uh, and hopefully that link still works. It's right here through Byteware, uh, Brightware. Uh, in addition to the textbook though, I've linked some uh, resources that I think are pretty advantageous. Uh, I have the, a set of tutorials that's actually created by Oracle, who is the curator of the Java programming language, as well as the Java API, which is a set of all of the uh, methods and classes that you might wanna look up when you're building your own software to find out what they do. So uh, I, have, um, I have mixed opinions on the textbook. Uh, I think it's good for what it is, but I, I certainly think that it's good to go ahead and supplement that with some of these other uh, materials that I've also posted. Now, well, what I will say where this textbook really shines is it's very verbose. It has a lot of examples and it explains the examples in great detail. So the, the thing that I don't like about the textbook, so I'm gonna forewarn you about that now, is that I feel like its narrative is muddled. Like it, it shows a lot of concepts, but one of the things that a educator should strive to do when they go to teach or instruct on a subject domain is to figure out how you thread one concept to the next in a way that they kind of build each other into each other like a jigsaw puzzle might, right? So imagine if the entire domain that you wanted to learn, big picture view, was broken down into a hundred different jigsaw puzzles. And then my job is to show you one piece and then show you the next and then connect them and connect them and connect them. I think the textbook just gives you all the jigsaw puzzles and allows you to kind of self connect them in many ways. Or maybe shows you a little bit on how to connect them, but it's, it's, it's really hazy. It's like maybe a, a jigsaw puzzle where the image is the color red. Oh, this finally opened. Excellent. Okay, let's go here. This is our uh, UNO CSI. So you can see, oh, my chat is, we have, let me go into the general talk. So you can see, 
we have a lot of people. Currently, 67 people are online inside the Discord. And those, and we have 373 that aren't. And it's a mix of um, current students, of alumni, of prof uh, professionals, as well as faculty and staff members. So you should definitely uh, get in on the Discord. In fact, if you have any questions, this is where I want you to post them at inside of 1583 Java 1. And this will allow me to merge our two disparate classrooms into one unity, right? It'll allow our face-to-face -face group to interact with our online group because you're still part of the same cohort. And so I love the fact that I have my face-to-face -face people here because we can start building a community on campus together, right? I want to see everyone be a part of uh, the student organizations we're going to redeploy over the course of the semester. And you online people, I want hopefully you to be able to make your way to campus so that you could start binding with your cohort. So I guess to give you a little bit of background history on myself, I had actually graduated through this program. So everything you're about to do, I've done before. So I recognize the value and one of the things that I really strove to do when I joined the department was to address what I thought were the deficiencies, the thing I wanted to teach and include those into the curriculum. Um, and so I forget how I got onto the point of why I, oh, but let me say that going through the program, one of the best experiences I had was the friends that I made starting at the beginning and what carried on through the end. And a lot of people think one of the best things about going to a face-to-face -face university is all the networking opportunities you, you have. And that's the real value you get. Like the distinction you're going to get between, a well, there's a number of, of, of valuable things. But in my mind, one of the most powerful is the ability to actually interact with the people around you. Uh, and so when you hear about networking opportunities, like think about what's happening in this classroom right now. Everyone in this classroom is in Java 1. And so you're on a trajectory. And if you stay on that trajectory four or five years from now, depending on what your uh, course load is, you're going to be graduating and you're going to be ready to go into the marketplace. You're going to be ready to go get a junior developer position somewhere. And so think about that. You uh, Between the, the online section and the in-person section, that's like 40 students. That's like 40 people that are all going to have different software developer jobs. So when you hear about networking opportunities, sure, you can get opportunities through the faculty and staff or the recruiters who come to campus or from you know, any one of these other ways. But the most powerful networking opportunity you're going to have is with each other. And so from my personal opinion, um, from my personal perspective, from my cohort, the people I graduated with, a lot of them found jobs because a new role opened up for one of my friends, and they knew that that role would be great for someone else that they were in class with. And they reached out and say, hey, we have this database administrator uh, uh, job that opened up, and you did awesome on that database homework. What are you doing right now? And so there's so much lateral jumps that happen in the uh, IT world. And so one of the best things you can do is always have your multitude of options available to you by making friends with everyone who's here. Because look, think about that, by the time you graduate, for all of you that succeed, you're a connection point for everyone else. And as, you're, as, as the job you're working at grows, you can recommend the friends that you partnered up with in uh, club meetings or on homework assignments or things like that. So keep that in mind. Like that's the thing you really want to cultivate. And that's why having the community on campus is so valuable and critical and important because it allows, it's not just a temporal, oh, let's have fun and learn here and now. It does provide that, but there's a longer value. There's a long-term value of establishing a community and being a part of it that will translate into opportunities in the future. Another thing is like is if everyone created a LinkedIn account right now and if you all 
uh, shared your own, uh, like cross indexed each other, it would just be a bunch of you and no computer science students. But in four years from now, all of a sudden, all of the references you're giving each other would become software developer references. So keep that in mind too. I would certainly recommend everyone creates a LinkedIn account and you start uh, uh, index. The, the entire point of what I'm saying is turn to each other and make study groups, right? Start to know who each other are. And if you don't know the answer to a question, you might. And then you might not know the answer to a question, you do. And so it's this idea that you start crowdsourcing a set of ideas and knowledge and then everyone grows in response to that. We were all stronger if we work together than apart. Okay, so let's see here. Let me close out of this. Anyway, this is uh, Discord. This is what I uh, would recommend uh, joining. And there's a link to that inside of the syllabus. Okay, so now let's actually talk about our learning objectives for this semester. And then I, if you want, we can like have a, I mean, today is a good lecture day to kind of talk about what the expectations of would be like as we move past this. Like, you know, we can have an open conversation about uh, what your trajectory is. But in this particular class, we can break the content down into, let's say, three different units. So, and then at the end of each unit, we're going to have a test to evaluate, to ensure that you understand all the principal concepts inside of that unit. So, like I said, the point of this class is to ensure that everyone is on equal footing for the next class, software design and development too. So, the first thing we're going to evaluate, the first thing we're going to learn is that algorithmic design and data model. That's what's gonna empower us to start designing and implementing software that does things, that produces results based off of some set of inputs. And so then the second part of the class will go into the DRY principles where DRY stands for don't repeat yourself. So after we complete unit one, effectively you'll have the basic knowledge to build any kind of software. You'll learn how to model your observations in the form of data, and that data might take a quantitative or qualitative form. And then you'll learn how to build an algorithms that process on top of your models for whatever information you're looking to extract from them. So you can improve though, like once you learn how to do the fundamentals, you can do it better. And so that's what DRY will be. We will find those instances where we find where we're constantly repeating parts of our logic and we'll see how, what mechanisms in the language allow us to be more concise, to be more precise and how to do it more effectively. And so that translates in a lot of good use cases like uh, better maintainability of code and the ability to write code much easier and the ability for the code to be much more readable as you don't repeat yourself as I repeated myself like three times there. Okay, and then the third unit is gonna be object or notice. One thing you might've noticed uh, with the textbook is that it is the late objects version. And so uh, it's my opinion that if we're gonna to learn to program, we should first learn about the concepts of just algorithm, isolate this higher level abstraction of modeling our software as objects and just go into the nitty gritty of just looking at using primitive data types and processing on, on that. So we're gonna start by ignoring objects in the first half of the class. But once we introduce objects, we're really going to buy into this concept of object-oriented design. And just to motivate what object-oriented design is, is uh, if you've coded in something like Python or JavaScript, or I saw Ruby, uh, some of the, those, all those languages support objects, but they don't, it's not mandatory that you use objects. And so uh, in a lot of old school applications, you could just write your code um, just as lines, just as step-by-step -step instructions. But when you get sufficiently large scale applications, 
specifications, that becomes unreadable. And so a better way of designing complex software systems is to start modeling your software entities as if they're physical objects. And so one reason why this craft, this domain of computer science is referred to as software engineering is very similar to how a traditional engineer will design components that assemble together to build an overall product. We assemble software components, these software objects that interact with other software objects that as a whole come together to build out our application. And so we can do that because of object-oriented principles. And so once you've learned that, then you're ready to graduate to the second class where things get much, much more interesting, in my opinion, and a lot more fun. Okay, is there any questions regarded, uh, regarding the learning objectives? Okay, okay. I guess, unfortunately, uh, the university requires that it is grades. And I hate the idea of grades, because um, because we're not only required to give grades, but we really enforce upon you, we really uh, convince you that that's the point of the class, is that you come to class for the purposes of getting a good grade. That's really not what the course is about, right? Every course you take it actually has a collection of learning objectives. The entire point of the course is that you learn the learning objectives. Once you ascribe a grade to it, like you can get an A, a B, a C, a D, or you can fail, then there's a metagame that's involved in taking a course, right? And since we drive the concept with things like scholarships and, and like, house, like resumes and even with job offerings, they all wanna know what your GPA is. What's the GPA? Like everyone knows what the GPA is based off of, it's based off the grades you got. So we put this high, high importance of grades, but I'm going to try to advocate to you. Grades are such an arbitrary, awful thing that's really, in my opinion, made the learning environment much more toxic, right? Because it's not about, because what happens, and I saw this in my own cohort. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a friend of mine who would look at the uh, what he would look at what the rubric was and find out what the minimal amount he needed to do in order to get an A, and then he stopped doing work after that. And I'm like, or maybe even a B, depending on whether how much he liked the material or not. It's like, that's not why you take the course. Look at the learning objectives and see if that's what you're getting away from. Because this, at the end of the day, this is what ends up happening. It's very possible that you come out of a program and you get all A's in the coursework, but if you did not learn the learning objectives, you will be unemployable. The letter A, the letter B means nothing if you come out and you can't perform what the syllabus says. And this does happen. You have people who, again, meta game the system or they buy stuff the system and find ways to cheat effectively, right? Like using Stack Overflow, using a uh, course hero, using uh, any number of, one, of any number of these other online resources that allow you to avoid doing any real learning. But the only person that you're sabotaging when you do that is sure you might get a grade, you might get a high grade for the class if, if you buy the learning process but still get the work done, but you're gonna sabotage yourself in the future. First of all, you're paying a ton of money for a class that you're not getting anything out of. Right? I don't think these classes are cheap, right? What is it, like a couple thousands of dollars to take a class? Like, if I was paying that, I'd certainly want to learn all the learning objectives and make sure I got the most out of it, right? I wouldn't want to take and spend all that money and then come out saying, I don't know what I learned. Like, that would frustrate me. Um, so look at the learning objectives make sure you're for each chapter we're covering make sure you're getting what you think you should be learning from that you'll know because the labs are very well orchestrated to give you challenging problems if you can solve all the problems in lab you know you've completed that section of content but i'm forced to give a grade so let me tell you what the rubric is uh so i may I, I'm going to put proficiency quizzes on there, which will just go ahead and allow me to see where each person is at. So those will appear on Moodle. 
And of course, I'll announce them as they're they put up on there. That'll be 10% of your grade. You'll have the practical labs. That's what you'll be doing in 1581. That's 30% of your grade. You'll have your coding projects as your homeworks are all already available to you right now. Uh, those are worth 30% of your grade. And then you have your tests, which are also 30% of your grade. Okay, so let's step through this a little bit. The proficiency quizzes will be quizzes on Moodle. It's just to ensure that you understand where you should be at. Uh, you'll have unlimited attempts at them, right? So it's really just busy work, right? It's, it's to make sure that I understand where everyone's at so that if you're not doing well in the quizzes, which would be hard because you have an unlimited amount of times to try it, then I can kind of reach out and find out, just ensure that you're in a good place in the, the semester. So that's like my life link to you. Uh, in terms of the practical labs, these are they are based off, has anyone heard of HackerRank? Has anyone heard of ICPC? Okay, so ICPC is so the ACM, the biggest student organization on campus and the professional organization that represents computer scientists. It's the Association of Computing Machinery. They host the biggest programming competition globally. It's an international programming competition called ICPC. It's the Intercollegiate Programming Competition. Well, I'd love to start assembling a team of students and bring them to Baton Rouge to start competing again. That would be awesome inside of our region. So uh, these the labs are modeled after programming competition problems or HackerRank is another similar uh, tool. HackerRank is uh, program, extreme programming is what they call this. It's programming challenge problems like what you'd see in a programming competition, but HackerRank actually, its clients, it provides free services to you. So if it gives free services to you, that means you're a product. And so their client is uh, companies, right? Looking to hire developers. And so th what they actually do is they are the ones who sell programming challenge questions and environment, not just questions, but a online environment for hiring people for the technical portion of an interview. So when you go to interview for your dev job, you're probably gonna go through three interviews, honestly. You'll have the first interview just to make sure that you have the ability to communicate, right? And that, that and, and it's they kind of just make sure that you are a good fit for the team. That you know, that uh, so things that make you a good fit. You believe in teamwork, right? You don't uh, just uh, you're able to kind of talk. That you uh, that you just don't get self involved. That you have the ability to articulate your concepts like that. So so if you have difficulties doing that, then start working on those now. So that's what the first filtration process is going to look like. Then the next step of the interview process will likely then be uh, uh, some form of like a tech challenge where they know what you say on your resume, but they never trust your resume. You know why? Because a lot of people lie on their resume. So the next thing they do is they give you these challenges, like they'll give you a problem and then have you whiteboard it. Or what HackerRank does is they outsource that work to HackerRank where they'll give you the problem in HackerRank and then you have to solve it in HackerRank. The lab problems are specifically designed to start prepping you for coding in that kind of environment. So that by the time you're done with these 1581 labs, you'll be more confident being in a situation where if given a set of specifications, a set of inputs and expected outputs, you know how to start thinking about designing an algorithm that allows you to create a solution to that. And so that has a number of great effects for us, right? You might want to, if you enjoy that, you might want to try the ICPC programming competition. Or you should create an account on HackerRank. You should do that anyway. They have Java problems. You can further elevate your Java skills for free going to HackerRank. Uh, but what it's going to do is it's going to prime you for success. And that's really what we're here to, today for, right? Like we're not just isolated where we want to learn these learning objectives because I'm not saying it's not that you don't want to, but we need to look at the larger picture. We want to teach you things about computer science that will also make you employable. Because at the end of the day, you're going to invest, what, like four or five years? That's a lot, a long time, right? That's like half a decade. And you're going to invest thousands of dollars, several thousands of dollars, quite possibly tens of thousands of dollars. You want to get something, you want to get a return on that investment, right? 
And so we're going to work alongside with you and we're going to guarantee that we're going to design a curriculum that if you step through it and if you put the hard work in and if you do all that, you ensure that you're getting the learning objectives from it, that you'll be really employable from the tail end of that. Okay. Um, so that was the labs. And then the coding project. So the labs are effectively uh, black box questions. By black box questions, it's going to give you a specification. It'll give you sample input. It'll give sample output. And then it doesn't care how you implement the solution, right? So it's all about building inside of you the ability to think algorithmically. It's, it's, all, it's all about problem solving, think, forcing you to think in a programming language, forcing you to think in terms of a algorithm, but that's not, that's not all you should be capable of doing. Uh, so the homeworks are going to take a different approach, a separate approach. So whereas the labs are kind of these black box entities where you, it, it only cares about you being able to process input into a particular output, the labs are going to be more representative of a complete application. So it'll be much grander in scope but it's also going to take an apprentice-like model, an apprenticeship model. So one of the deficiencies I saw when we had a traditional homework where we would just give you the specification is that you had to rely on yourself to figure out how to build out the, the code base, how to build out the application. And you don't, you're, you're not really in a position to do that well, right? So it was like priming you for failure. So the form of the homeworks now is the homework split in half. The first half, and so because of this, the homework documents look like they're very large, but they're not. Uh, it's just they're very explicit. So the first half of the homework will be step-by-step -step instructions showing, telling you how to build this basic application, like how to build a, for instance, a, um, a dodging game or how to build like a, a roguelike game. Uh, and so once you follow the step-by-step -step instructions, you'll see it'll use, this, it'll use a top-down iterative approach where it's going to posit, this is what our goal is going to be in terms of a design challenge. And then it'll show you how to implement on what the goal is. And then it'll show you how to test it. And then after a couple different steps, you'll actually have built something simple into something more complex. So it's going to show you, it's gonna break down repeatedly how you should approach building an application. Now, the difficulty here is that, in, at least in this first class, you're not gonna be designing your own applications on your own. So like, that's not part of the coursework in this class, but you should do it in, on your own. Like you should, as you're working on a project, say, let me see if I can build this thing. But yeah, the, the homeworks will step you through building an application, for the first half. And then the second half, you'll be challenged to prove that you understand the concepts after you've been shown how to do something. Because in an apprenticeship model, I said it was apprenticeship based. So let me define what that means. In an apprenticeship model, usually you have a master craftsperson who takes on an apprentice and they show them how to do something effectively. And so that's what the first half of those homework documents are designed to do. They show you how starting from nothing but a sentence, a elevator pitch of this is what we want to build, how you can start on a journey from the first milestone to the second milestone to the third milestone to effectively build out the complete thing you want. But then in an apprenticeship model, is not just about the craftsperson, the master craftsperson showing, then they have the apprentice show that they understood it and then have to perform on their own. And so the second half of the homework is you have to add features off of the basic assignment. And those features are of your own design. So all the homeworks are gonna be game-based. Uh, the latter homeworks will make use of a uh, API that Princeton made available called standard draw. And so you'll walk through the first half and then you'll get the chance to design and build on top of it. So I think they're really good, fun, challenging homeworks. Uh, and I, uh, if you have any issues with them, of course, drop into Discord and go ahead and uh, ask. Now, in terms of the test, there'll be three tests in the class. And that makes sense because we said there's a test after each unit. 
Uh, the way that the test average works is either all three tests can be averaged together, or if test three, which is the final, uh, is higher than either test one or test two, it replaces that. So, so it's either the max of test one and test two, and then test three and test three as the average, or it's test one, test two, and test three. So if you fail a test, that's fine. You have a chance to make it up in the final. Also, I don't like the innate disparate nature of having person-to-person -person testing versus online testing. So we'll do all of our testing online. So there won't be any in-person tests. Uh, and that way that's a level playing field with everybody. There's no advantage one way or the other. The only advantage that you have for coming in person is I get to ask you questions and get answers, which I wasn't able to do for a long time. I'd have to look at this little chat box, which I haven't been doing. So let me see if anyone said anything. I'm gonna leave and join. Oh, oh that's a direct message. Just keep in mind that uh, everyone can see my direct messages. Okay, let's see here. In terms of letter grades, it's a 10 point scale, except that uh, D's are like, D's are in a passing grade. So we just push that all the way down to a 50. But you have to have a C or higher to go to Java 2. So at least strive <laughs> nothing more than for a C. Uh, let me talk about how homeworks also right now, I'll take the opportunity to kind of explain the methodology for turning in your homework. When you turn in your homework, that's not just, so let me restate. Probably what you're used to with homework is you turn in homework, it gets graded and you're given back a grade, right? Is that mostly what everyone's experience is? Yeah, that's an awful model. Cause uh, I mean, it, it's good because it challenges you and having a grade attached to it is a motivating factor for you to actually turn it in, but then the learning stops in that, that model. And so in my opinion, the homework is the, the chance that you actually have to design your own software. Like I said, when you start reading through these homework assignments, you're gonna, the first 50 points are given to you because you just walk through, you just give them back to me what I give to you. But the other 50 points come from your own design. Well, if we're truly going to adopt an apprentice-like model, it's not just so much that you show me that you know how to do it, but that I then give you feedback. So you not only have to turn in your homework, but you have to schedule with me a, some Zoom visits or a Discord audit where I will have you load up your code, I'll have you share your screen, load up your code and show me what you implemented do a quick demo and then step me through the code on how you did it. And then that'll give me a chance to see your coding conventions, to see how you implemented your solution, and then to give you actual feedback on how you can improve it. Because at the end of the day, the reason why I'm here and I'm not just a YouTube video in front of you is that I can interact with you. And as you progressively learn, as you take this journey, I can be at your side and give you feedback on how to improve and optimize. So keep that in mind, you won't, even if you submit your code, you won't get a grade until you have scheduled an audit. Now, this is the other thing. You don't necessarily have to uh, schedule your audit right away. You can do it at any time in the semester, right? So you have to get it submitted. So I know that everyone's on track, but you can schedule the audit at whatever time is convenient for you, but it won't have a grade until it's been audited. Does, it, does that make sense? And so we'll just, and we'll do the audits online as well. Okay, let's see here. Uh, academic dishonesty. Where I oh, and then I have a very tentative schedule that just kind of maps out how I want to cover these units, but these are always subject to change because I like to refactor and optimize this course every semester. And so I had the, uh, I just taught the um, second class over the summer. So I have ideas on how I might mutate this class further. So keep in mind, you might be my guinea pigs. Okay, so with that said, that's the syllabus. We took, 
almost a full hour to read through the syllabus. I hate, but I think it's super critical that everyone has a strong, firm understanding of what the map looks like before we start the journey, because otherwise you start off lost. And that's the, the worst way to start any kind of journey. So before we progress any further, because I still got 15 minutes, are there any questions? I'm curious, just for the sake of curiosity, I noticed that the textbook was 2018 and we're the latest version of Java is quite a few versions. Of yes, so yes, I'm that's curious. my, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you've definitely hit upon my displeasure of this textbook. And so here, let me further lambast that. <laughs> so the Ditel and Ditel book is a very solid book, but one problem that we have in academia, 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 especially courses that revolve around textbooks are best when the subject domain is very stable. Like think of domain knowledge as like algebra or geometry or calculus or biology or chemistry or physics. And so in all of these domains, since very little changes, since there's enough maturity in these domain knowledges that you can have a textbook. And the only reason why new editions get published every so often is so that the market doesn't get flooded with old textbooks and it decreases the value. So they just keep releasing new editions so they can charge you a insane amount for those, that information. In computer science, there are, now in computer science, it's a relatively new domain, right? Like we're talking maybe a little older than 60 years. And in terms of being a truly viable profession, much like half that time maybe 30 years in terms of where it's really hit mass market adoption. The fundamentals that govern what we do in computer science, that is super mature, it's stable. In fact, a lot of the theory is based off of concepts that exist before computers did. In fact, one of the worst things we could call this domain is computer science. It's, well, we say that, but the reason why that's so bad is when I say computer, what does everyone think? Yeah, they think of a machine, right? Would you believe that a computer was actually a profession at one time? Before we had what we now refer to as computers, what do you think a computer as a profession, as someone who is employed as a computer do? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, has anyone seen the, the movie Hidden Figures? Yeah, that's effectively what computers were, right? It, it was a set of people who would take in a set of formulas, grokked the result, and gave it back. And so we, if we think back to what an actual computer was, the profession of computer, and not the machinery of a computer, right? Like computer science isn't, as, and that's one of the worst things that I always get when people find out that I teach computer science. They're like, I'm having some Wi-Fi connectivity issues, or I'm having problems with Windows. I don't know how to use Windows. I haven't touched a Windows device in a decade. I can't solve your problem. Like that's a wrong type of computer. But the branding on what we call computer, we've changed in our language, our linguistic have changed. But when you think of computer, when we talk about computer science, think about what a com what computers do, or if you were employed as what a human computer would do. It's the process. It's a it's a it's the science of processes. And by science, again, a lot of people argue that that's a bad term, but it really isn't. Um, and I'll, I'll articulate why I think that is. A lot of people think, well, in science, you build a hypothesis, you like do uh, some investigation to see if your hypothesis is correct, and then you go ahead and convert that into some kind of theory, right? You use some kind of evidence-based approach to show that your hypothesis is either right or wrong. Uh, and yeah, like that is a form of science. Uh, that is what the scientific method is, right? But uh, I would also argue that a 
critical and equally viable component of any science is that you're able to articulate a set of phenomena or observations to a model. So think about how when you learn uh, biology or chemistry, right? Like you can process that, you can model that using numerical data. You can articulate a phenomena that was witnessed inside of a wet lab and then write it down on paper and then forecast. You can make predictions off of that. And anything that is a true science that we consider a science has a concept in mathematical modeling. Well, guess what we specialize in? So it's one, it's one of the frustrating things. Uh, when growing up, math is taught so poor. Who here thinks that they're good at math? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, no one, you, it's not your fault. The education system is broken for math. And the reason why is when you look at all the great mathematicians, if you look at the thing that motivated math, it's not, it was to solve problems. They were observing something like if I drop this can, which I'm not, so it's liquid in it, and let it fall, how can I express in a quantitative way what the relationship of gravity is? How long would it take before it hits the ground? Someone observed that and found a function that maps to that. And then everyone else uses that function to define that behavior, that observed behavior. That's what math is used for. It's another way of expressing ideas. So when you learned, when you were going to uh, your English classes, you learned how to take letters and assemble them into words and bind concepts to those words. And then you were able to take those words and combine them to build more complex concepts, to articulate from one human being to another human being, a set of events, a, a phenomena or an observation. So it goes from one mind's eye to the other. And you could do the exact same thing with mathematics, right? But you have to take your set of phenomena and map it in the form of data to be either quantitative or qualitative. And then you can give that to someone else and they can decipher it, they can read it, they can interpret it and then get your same results. But the powerful thing about math is that it is reproducible. We'll talk more about that later, but that's one of the driving forces around how sciences work. And that's really what we mean when we say computer science. Now, going back to the original topic, the textbook. Okay, so the textbook is great in the mature stuff, the stuff that is stable, the stuff that does not change often. So there's certain things, and these are the things that we're gonna be learning about over the course of the semester of, when we start designing our own algorithms, that's a very stable process. It doesn't in fact matter what programming language you're using. You don't even have to use a programming language. You could use pseudocode that doesn't compile into any actual computer code, right? But it could, it could be uh, just for human readability's sake. But there is a certain set of steps that we've developed as a domain that allows us to start modeling observations in the form of data that can be processed on and then building algorithms to process that data into information or solutions or whatever we want to call that, whatever it is we're looking to get from the model. Um, so this is what, well, so those are the things that the textbook does well at, you know, despite the fact that it was published in 2018, it'll allow us to identify, well, what are the critical parts of an algorithm in terms of the operations we need to do? And then how are they implemented in Java? Now, Java is a very old programming language. Uh, Java is older or as old as the internet is. In fact, J the reason why Java surged in popularity was it was supposed to be the internet, the, the coding language of the internet. And it, it, it's an open source language. It's on mass adoption. Uh, Java is still super, super popular in enterprise level software be, for a number of reasons. Like you can't be like, there's certainly popular uh, soft um, uh, programming languages out there like Python or Ruby or uh, JavaScript. And they're all good in smaller scaled applications. But when you're talking about building an application that's hundreds of thousands of lines of code that verges on millions of lines of code, those languages become unsustainable. And so it's what, what it's the way Java is implemented. It's part of the C family. So a lot of its methodologies are inherited from C++, which it inherited from C. All those 
concepts were driven by large scale applications themselves. And so Java scales very well. And if you know how to do Java, it's very easy to learn the other programming languages. Whereas if you learn another programming language, there's a lot more you have to learn in order to be able to do Java effectively. So with that said, let's go back to how awful the textbook is. I keep trying to circle back, like I, we're in a drain right now. So um, it's great for the stable, mature stuff, but way back in the day, Java, when Sun used to manage uh, Java, it's now uh, Oracle who's the curator of Java. But when Sun used to curate over Java, it was super stable. Like you might see a new Java release every two years. So that's a great language if you're writing textbooks because it doesn't change often. But the popular thing in today's clientele is languages that are progressively changing quickly. That puts a lot of stress on us as developers, but it gives us a lot of more options as developers as well. Like if you look at JavaScript, JavaScript has game-changing, game-breaking API changes every year. Every year they release a new set of uh, JavaScript instructions that can completely break your code if you adopt to it. Uh, same thing with Python, like Python, is currently, I think they're in 3.11 right now. And uh, and they, they release a, I think they're on at least an annual cycle as well. So every year, Python has a new language that's built off the old language, but with changes. Well, in order for Java to stay relevant, they've adopted a six month cycle. So, as of now, we're in Java 18. If you look at the textbook, it's Java 8. <laughs> we are 10 versions of Java behind with the textbook. The other big complaint I have about the textbook, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the textbook, that I, is, uh, is that it was, it's both a good thing and a bad thing. The original textbook was written for C++. Uh, and so, it got translated, C++ and Java are very similar. So it got adapted to also support the Java programming language. They actually wrote an edition that also does Python. Now, the reason why this is good is if you want to, after this course, after next course, after you gain a mastery of one programming language, that's what you should strive to do. Uh, uh, don't spread yourself too thin. Don't try to learn multiple languages all at once. Learn one language really well to understand how it solves all the problems that you might encounter building a complete application. And then once you understand what the design patterns are from one language, you can then see how other languages use or deviate from those design principles. So once you feel comfortable learning Java, you can buy the Ditel and Ditel C++ book, uh, plus book and go chapter by chapter. It's exactly the same book, but in a different programming language. So it's a great way, it's a great tool for you to become uh, a polyglot, a, a, a multi uh, uh, accessible in multiple programming languages, but really the first is the most difficult because it, it's all governed by the same kind of set of rules and, and syntaxes for the most part. Uh, but uh, the problem I have with that is that it omits a lot of the motivating principles that the Java architects selected. So if I took a book that was originally written for C++ and then I just translate into Java, well, all of the design decisions that the Java architects made for building the coding languages aren't in the book because it's not really a Java book, is it? It's like a book that was written in another language that then was just translated, but all of like the, like the meta humor, like the puns, like the, the background information gets lost. And so that's one of my biggest complaints is that there's a lot of like modeling concepts, like how does Java get input into its software package and how does it get it back out? And they use this really powerful abstraction called streams. And you do get to hear about streams, but it's like in this really, again, it's, it feels to me like a uh, jigsaw puzzle where they give you all the pieces and you have to piece it together yourself. So the advantage of having this book in a, uh, classroom setting is I can help you piece it together. But if you want to also help yourself do that, check out the tutorials and content that I gave to you. And again, a new version of Java is going to be upon us later this year as well. It goes through two new cycles. It's impossible to keep up with the textbook now. With Java's new initiative of changing the, the, uh, the programming language every six months, there's no textbook that can keep up with it. But that's why I always advocate use the documentation. 
The best textbook is one Oracle, the curator of the language provides, and it has tutorials, it has sample code, it has explanations. Pretty much, it's better than a textbook. And guess what? It's free. And it's what the actual, that's what professional developers use to learn how to, or you uh, learn how to use whatever new tooling's happening with Java. So it's better to learn how to use that stuff now. But the reason why we use the other textbook is because it also has those mature concepts, those stable ideas that are pretty consistently like calculus or geometry, but in the computer science world. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, let me show you some other cool stuff because I have a couple of minutes. Um, let's see. So this is the Moodle. It's uh, very verbose. So all the PowerPoint slides from the textbooks are here. Absolutely hate these slides. So I'll probably try to make some of my own. The reason why I don't like these, the slides are lazy too. Has anyone looked at these slides? Man, I just don't want to have the ragging on the textbook, but it's just an abridged version of the textbook. So we'll, we'll probably do our lectures by just coding. We'll, we'll look at code and then I'll try to talk about how in code these concepts relate over. I think that that's a better approach, a more workshop style approach to doing our code. With that said, if you uh, you can get to our webpage, cs.uno.edu. If you go to student resources here, you can find all the CS. Okay, let me show you some of this stuff. You can see all your CSCI courses that are offered from the department and when they're offered. So this is a good place to go. Uh, uh, information about internships, scholarships, when we get the new tutoring schedule, you can find it here, uh, the student clubs, research opportunities for undergraduate level, which I encourage you to do. You get a taste of what the research uh, world is like. You can go to my portal. So everyone know about my apps at uno.edu? Okay, perfect. So one of the cool things for CSCI students is gonna be this web terminal. If you go to this web terminal, it'll bring you to, um, where is that, that's here. It'll allow you to, oh, so I logged out. Let's see if I can remember. And then you can log into this if you click on that link. Oh. Okay, got to use the right password though. And so here, I'll probably be doing some of our uh, demo code inside here. Everyone has access to it. If you go click on that link, you can have a pre, you can have Java pre-installed in essentially Linux environment where because we're going to be learning how to use a POSIX compliant uh, um, terminal. So here, this is our terminal here. You'll learn how to be able to navigate everything from the command line, which is super important as a developer. You should learn how to be able to operate an OS from the command line. That's effectively how your software is gonna have to feed instructions to the OS. So you should be proficient in that. Uh, and there's applications that are only available to you at the command line level. Uh, so that's all another thing we're gonna be learning this semester in addition to Java. But uh, yeah, if, if you see here, I can do, we, so Java separated into two different pieces of software. We have the JDK, the Java Developer Kit. And so you can see we have Java 17 installed on this machine. And again, this is all pre-installed. So whether you're on Windows, whether you're on a, a Mac, if you go into the web terminal, everyone can be working in the same environment. Makes my job way easier. And then you have the Java runtime environment. So that's going to be Java here, and you can see the, the Java runtime environment is going to be uh, um, version 17 as well. And so the JDK will allow us to take our source code and compile it into what we call uh, bytecode, which so it, it, it goes from being human readable into machine readable. Once we compile it, we can't read it anymore, but then it becomes an application and we can feed it to the computer and the computer can execute it. So then once we have our bytecode, once we have our executable Java code, we feed it to the JRE, the Java runtime environment, and anything that has a JRE, which is every like toasters have JREs. I mean, uh, the one reason why J, uh, Java is so prolific is that it, it is 
one of the, if not most portable, what we call portable language. Portable language means that you could take your source code written from one machine and easily put it on another machine and still uh, run it. And so that was one of the big advantages Java had over languages like C++ and C, because that actually uh, compiled down to object code, which was uh, machine dependent. It actually effectively went down to assembly code that ran on the machine itself. Java code, Java is both a compiled language and an interpreted language. So when you go ahead and compile code to run in Java, it doesn't actually run on the machine itself. It runs on a virtual machine, this layer. That's the JVM, the Java virtual machine, and it executes there. And so the reason why that's so popular is it's portability. Anything that supports the JVM supports your Java code, but it's also because of security as well. You don't have to give root access to your machine to run Java applications because it's been sandboxed inside of the JVM. So it just gives you a little idea of what Java is and how it's distinguished a little bit. Oh, it looks like I'm out of time, but yeah, this is just one other thing I want to show is that you do have available to a Java workspace without having to install anything. So uh, I guess that's it. Does anyone have any follow-up questions before we dismiss? Excellent. Well, everyone have a good uh, first day. I hope the return to or your first incoming uh, exposure to university has been great. and. Good luck this week, and I'll see everyone on Thursday. Uh, I want to ask, is the homework, is it due Thursday? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, no, it's not.